Hi, welcome to the noise path and check out what I have here. This is a Carl Zeiss Axioscope microscope. This was basically salvaged from the trash. I spent at least eight hours rebuilding it from scratch, cleaning it, taking all the broken pieces of grease and everything out of the various joints in it. This is a really complex piece of optical engineering and it has differential interference contrast microscopy as well, which I will show you and we'll talk about it. It has all of its objective lenses, very precise XY bed as well as very precise focusing to be expected because you can have very high uh, magnification on this. It has several different filters that can be attached to it. I even have the camera attachment at the top, which is great because it allows me to connect this to an HDMI capture so we can look directly under the microscope with all of its precision and beautiful images that it can produce. I only have one complaint about it, and that's the fact that it is lit with a halogen lamp. And believe it or not, this is still fairly standard because of the extraordinary brightness these lamps can produce and it has its own housing, the light enters the microscope and hits various mirrors and, and prisms in order to split the light between the eyepiece, the camera, the objective lenses and the reflection comes back. It's pretty complicated. You can also have these lit from the bottom, but it doesn't help us in our lab because I'm mostly interested in looking at things which I want to illuminate from the top and I don't want to see right through, like uh, integrated circuits for example. So what I want to do is, if, if it's possible, to replace this with an LED. So I have bought an LED module for it, a really, really bright one, because I also want to increase the brightness. I want to show you what's over here and see if we can retrofit this with an LED. It has a built-in power supply, which we will also take a look and see if we can service to make sure it's working well. But yeah, it's a really beautiful instrument. So let's take a look inside. Of course, these slits allow the heat to come out. Obviously, a halogen lamp up to 100 watts in here can get pretty warm. And here it is, you can see clearly the light inside. Let me adjust this a little bit, there it is. Here's our halogen lamp. Obviously you should never touch these, the oil from your hand damages the glass, the quartz. And then here we have a mirror in the back which collects as much of the light from the back side because obviously halogen lamps are 360 degrees almost. So then reflection also goes back inside. And there's a few lenses in here to focus it and at the right place in the, in the item that you're looking at. So we want to remove all of this but use the mount still and see if we can attach something in here to act as this halogen lamp. So let's go and see if we can build something. So one of the things I wanted to do was to keep the look of the microscope when I add this uh, LED change to it. So here's what I've done. You can see I can remove that from the shroud, so I kept the original shroud, of course, as it was. And I added some circuitry to it to accommodate a fan and a couple of other things. So I wanted to have a really powerful LED. So here's an LED that's underneath this. This is about a maximum rate of 100 watts. Probably never going to run it at 100 watts. There's also a small DC-DC converter. This is going to run about 30 volts. And the DC-DC converter is there to help run that fan. And I had to take an angle grinder to quite a few of these pieces. Obviously, I took the optics out before doing that in order to make everything fit together because there were pieces of metal used to hold the halogen lamp in place which are not needed anymore. So now this guy is going to need, need about 30 volts to run this LED. The power supply inside the microscope is only 12 volts. So we're going to need some other modification and I added this because I only wanted one wire to come out. So let's close this back up together just so that we can see it fit on the microscope and then we have to turn our attention to the power supply inside the microscope itself, make sure it's up to date. And here's the power supply module out of the microscope, and it is made in West Germany, so it gives you an idea of the age of this thing. It's really quite well made, obviously it fits into the form factor of the microscope. And I did quite a bit of measurement on these components without taking it apart too much, and surprisingly enough, most of them are okay. This still needs to be recapped fully, of course, at some point, but I think it's good enough for us to be able to take a step forward and try out to see if we can get the LED attached to this. So I don't want to modify this, I want to keep the microscope in its original form. So if I connect the output of this to a boost converter, I should be able to boost it all the way up to the 30 volts required for the LED. And then of course the little DC-DC converter I showed you inside the LED module will step it back down to 12. I know it's a little bit silly, you can just have two wires going into this and it will do the same thing. But this way I just, you know, keep everything in one wire connected. So after playing around for a while, I eventually settled on this solution. I ended up buying one of these DC-DC converter modules which have become quite popular. 3D printed a case for it and put it in there and I'm using a 48 volt external power supply. I ended up not using the one internally on here for a variety of reasons. And then this just essentially steps it down. So I can get 100 watts into the LED using this DC-DC converter with very good efficiency, almost 95% or so. So if I just go ahead and turn it on, you can see, let me focus a little bit in there, so you can see what kind of power numbers we're talking about. 
So the LED is running around 36 volts, but it is current limited. The nice thing about these DC-DC converters is that they can run at constant current. So you can see about 90 watts going into it, which is a lot, but of course it is really bright. And the color temperature of the light is also quite different. There are some fundamental issues that can come from using a multi-point illumination, which is what this is, compared to a halogen lamp. But anyway, we won't get into that. I'm excited to see the result of it. So it works really well. There's also some terminals in here which you can connect to something else if you wanted to power something else at the same time. Yeah, so it works like a very nice solution. So now the question is, of course, well, how will all of this works? You can see some light leaking out as well. And there it is. You can see there the point of light coming out from the microscope. So I have an integrated circuit, which I designed many, many years ago when I was a student, under this so we can take a look at it and see some of its features. And I can show you some of the capabilities of the microscope too. So if you're curious on how we're going to capture this, I'm not going to put a camera in front of this because you're not going to appreciate the optical performance. And it looks fantastic through these eyepieces. But it also looks really nice through the path onto the camera. So this is a Nikon D700, fairly old camera, full frame. And I can open the shutter of this and do a live preview. Unfortunately, the live preview of this is not very fast frame rate, so I would have to change this at some point, but we're going to use this path in order to see it, so I can do an HDMI capture directly from the camera, so you basically see as good of an image as it is possible. Okay, let's take a look at this chip here. I'm going to try and bring this into focus. And there it is, check it out, it looks quite nice. This is a 130 nanometer CMOS IC. This was in IBM process, which is now part of Global Foundries. It's a millimeter wave track and hole amplifier operating at around 30 gigahertz. It's intended for a front-end ADC. It's quite old, I think maybe more than 15 years old now. And you can see a lot of interesting features on it. You can see quite a few inductors and different metal layers. At the top, you see two inputs, left and the bottom. That's the input clock and the output. And the pads you see all around, they look a different color because they don't have passivation on top of them. But there are a lot of passive components on this chip, which we can take a look at if we zoom in further in. At this view, you get a nice global look at the IC. But I really want to show you the internal inductors, the different metal layers, and how this microscope can show you those features, especially with a really shallow depth of field. So here we are at 50 times magnification. At this magnification, the amount of light coming back to the camera is quite limited, so the camera doesn't do justice to the clarity of this image that we're looking at. Unfortunately, I'm going to probably have to change the camera to make it better in the future. But what you see on the left side are the, is the top metal layer. You can see it's also connected to the pads, and there's two little inductors in there. And I can now change the focusing plane, because it's so shallow, to take a look at a metal layer that's directly underneath it. So let me see if I can get that into focus. There it is. Check it out. That's the metal layer right underneath this metal. And let me get it a little bit better in focus. So you see those inductors go down into that other metal layer and connect to it. And that is where, in fact, some of the transistor connections are also made. But I can also go further down, even lower. And then soon, you can see the metal layer underneath comes into focus. And now we have even more inductors at that layer. This process, I think, had about maybe 9 or 10 metal layers. A lot of them, unfortunately, you cannot see because there is a, a mesh covering it and a lot of circuitry underneath which are invisible because of the metal. But the silicon oxide, which is what separates the different le metal layers, is transparent. That's glass. And that's why we can go from metal layer to metal layer. It's really quite amazing to see different things come into view. Remember, these metals are only separated by a few microns. So their depth of field is really, really shallow on this microscope, allowing you to also get a feeling for the height difference between these different metal layers. I, I always really enjoy going between different metals and seeing how these different features come into focus, going from one place to another. Yeah, it's really quite mesmerizing. But we're going to do a lot more analysis like this in the future. That's why I set up this microscope. But I do want to show you this uh, difference in interference microscopy, differential interference microscopy that is part of this, and it creates contrast. And some really interesting features of the image can come out of this. Let me set that up and show you what it looks like. So the way this principle works is that the light is split into opposite polarization, but maintain coherence between the, these two paths. And these two paths then go through the sample and are combined in a particular way causing the minute differences in the height in different places in the image to interfere with each other and therefore be revealed. It's a really fascinating uh, imaging technique invented actually by a Polish uh, engineer. So let's take a look and see what it is. So right now this is a normal image. This is a surface of the pad. It looks really nice and smooth. This is the surface of the aluminum pad that you would normally do wire bonding to. 
but it's not actually smooth. It has tiny, tiny imperfections, which we can bring out by enabling this feature. There we go. So now we're looking at it through the DIC, and I'm going to adjust, make minor adjustments to this difference in the length just, just to get the right point. There you go. Look at that. Look at these. These imperfections on the surface are very, very tiny. These are comparable to the wavelength of the light you're looking at. You're in the nanometer range. But because they're self-interfering, they come out as contrast in the image you're looking at. It's just beautiful, the fact that you can do this. And you can imagine why this is so useful, because you can see and differentiate depth differences between things far, far below what you would be able to do with normal imaging. And you can go and look at different places in this image, and some really amazing stuff comes out by looking at this. So here's an example of the pad. Let me see if there's something else we can do. So here's another example. I really need to get a better camera, because this looks so much nicer in person. So these are capacitors. Uh, these are MIM capacitors that are on, on some of the lower level metals, and I'm going to adjust this a little bit so we can get an idea of some of the imperfections of the surface. Let's see if I can bring it out. And look at that. I mean, you can clearly see all the tiny little speckles of differences between the surfaces. This is just a natural from manufacturing. But look at that. They all come out. It's really amazing that you can do this uh, at this level. I can never get tired of looking at chips like this. So yeah, there you have it. I'm really happy with this setup. We can do so much more now. Look at the details of these IC designs in the future. I hope you like this. This is just a preview of things to come.